worked. I'm not sure um, what's going on or why it didn't work. Oh, okay. So I'm going to have to have like a two setup thing here with notes here, presentation here. So we're going to make the best of it. So let's just start. So my name is Martez Mott. I am a PhD student in the Information School at the University of Washington, and I am presenting on behalf of my co-authors, um, Radu Daniel Vadavu, Sean Kane, and Jacob Robrock. And the title of our paper is Smart Touch, Improving Touch Accuracy for People with Motor Impairments um, with Template Matching. Um, so Touch is one of the most dominant ways users interact with modern computing devices. And the predominance of touch can really be attributed uh, to the proliferation of touch-enabled devices, such as smartphones and tablets. So many of us here have smartphones and tablets. Some of you right now are on your smartphones and tablets. That's OK. I won't hold it against you. Um, so, but there's also these um, other touch-enabled devices that we interact with on a like, semi-regular basis. So perhaps some of you checked in to your flight on your way to Kai using a touch-enabled kiosk at an airport, and perhaps some of you use um, touch-enabled devices at like your local grocery store if you go to like the checkout lanes, right? The self-checkout lanes. Um, but for many people with motor impairments, however, um, touch-enabled devices are inaccessible and inoperable. So for people with um, motor impairing disabilities, such as cerebral palsy or muscular dystrophy, um, touch-enabled devices just seem not to work very well. And so um, that's not the, the problem with touch-enabled devices isn't, um, doesn't lie with the user, however. It lies with the implicit assumptions touchscreens make about users and their abilities. Um, so, for example, if a user wants to um, touch a target, touchscreens presume users can suspend an arm, um, extend a finger, and land and lift within the bounds of their target. Um, but for many people with motor impairments, um, extending a single finger it can be difficult or impossible. So instead, they may touch with the back or side of their hand with multiple fingers or with their knuckles. And as a result, the system can't um, the system can't um, infer this type of touch input. And in addition to that, it's also difficult for many users with motor impairments to land and lift within the bound of the target because that requires a great deal of fine motor control. Um, so our goal is to allow users to touch in however their abilities allow and for the system to correctly infer the user's intended touch locations. Um, so to um, accomplish this goal, we took an ability-based design approach to touchscreen accessibility. Um, so we did that by doing two things. First, we did an exploratory study of the touch behavior of people with motor impairments. And then using that information, we created and evaluated a novel template matching algorithm to improve touch accuracy for people with motor impairments that we call smart touch. Um, so the first thing I'm going to describe is an exploratory study of our uh, of touch behavior of, of, part of people with motor impairments. Um, so we did a lab study where we recruited 10 um, people with motor impairments. They came in the lab and um, did a couple of different touch trials with us. And all of our participants had some motor impairing disability that impacted their ability to control either their fingers, their hand, or their arm. Uh, so for the study procedure, we used the Microsoft Interactive um, table, the PixelSense, and we asked users, um, we presented the crosshairs to the users, and we asked the, um, our participants to touch the crosshairs however they wanted. Um, so from our study, we um, collected all this touch data. So we had a couple of different measures of interest, some things that we were really interested to see. Um, so that's what I'm about to describe to you now. Um, so the first is concurrent touches. So typically when a person touches a touch screen, um, the, a single finger touches the screen and the contact point is registered and the centroid of that contact point is taken as the user's intended touch location. But for however, if you're a person with a motor impairment and you touch with the side or the back of your hand, multiple concurrent touches get registered. That's represented by the, the like semi-transparent blue ellipses that you see on the screen here. Um, so then the question becomes, of, these, of all of these touch points, which touch points represent the user's intended touch location? Um, so we looked at the, we were interested to know, um, on average, like how many concurrent touches um, get generated by the touch behavior of our participants. And the answer is that, you know, a lot. So you can see here from um, this box plot the distribution of the number of concurrent touches um, generated by our participants. And you can see that there's quite a variety here, right? So you can see... Um, for participant four, they were the only one who actually touched in such a way that only produced one concurrent touch at a given time, and compare that to participant 10, whose range went somewhere between five and 
uh, went somewhere between five and eight concurrent touches per trial. Uh, so the next measure of interest was land on distance. So the land on distance is the distance between the centroid of the first touch to the center of the crosshairs for each trial. And for that, we were also interested to see what, on average, what was the, the distance that our, part, what was the average land on distance that our participants were able to achieve um, on the touch screen. And we can see here that um, there's quite a big spread here. So uh, note that these are measured, um, the distance to target here is measured in centimeters, not millimeters. Um, so you'll also see a, a huge range of abilities here at work. So for example, participant one, um, their average land on, dis their land on distance, land on distances were somewhere between five and like around 45 centimeters and uh, we're back, okay. Um, so <laughs> com compare that to, this is funny, compare that to participant four um, whose um, land or distance, the spread was uh, much shorter. Uh, so similarly, we looked at liftoff distance. Uh, the liftoff distance is the distance between the center of the last touch to the center of the crosshair. And you can see here the results are very similar to land on. We see a, quite a big spread here, very large um, average land liftoff distances. Uh, so the key findings here is that the mean land on and lift off distances were much higher than those reported for non-disabled users. And this is a problem because remember, for, for a user to acquire a target, they have to both land and lift within the bounds of the target. And so from the numbers we just saw, that those, um, those ranges are much too big to accommodate the size of current touchscreen targets. Um, and the second thing we observed was that touching with various parts of the hands create very multi-point touches, right? So that's the problem. The user can't, I mean, the system can't infer where the user is trying to touch. Um, so the key challenge is uh, we must consider the user's entire touch process. We know from our data that we can't rely solely on the initial contact point or the last contact that the user makes with the screen to infer where the user is intending to touch. And the second key challenge is how do we take all of these multiple concurrent touches and from that be able to, um, so how can we map multiple uh, touch contact areas to a user's intended XY target location? Um, so to do that, uh, we developed a new approach we call Smart Touch. Smart Touch is a, is a template matching approach to improve touch accuracy. And what I'm gonna explain to you now are the steps involved in our Smart Touch algorithm. Um, so the first step is um, pose extraction. So, um, we, we have all of this touch data and the idea is that we want to extract only the most relevant touch data, right? We don't want everything. We just want what we consider to be the most relevant. Um, so first thing we do is we, um, we segment the touch process into frames. Um, so the touch process is every touch that occurs from touch down to lift off. And a new frame is created every time a touch is added, every time a touch is a registered touch is updated, lost, things like that. Um, so then the next thing we need to do is, um, so the next step we did, so from our study we realized that people would tend to dwell when they were getting near their target. Um, so we decided that we needed this notion of like stability. That's kind of the time where we believe users felt like they were actually acquiring their target. Um, so we created um, two stability scores, movement stability and shape stability. So we go through each uh, frame of the touch process and we label each as um, either movement or shape stability, um, either movement stable or shape stable. And then we look for overlap. So which frames are both movement and shape stable? And then from that, we take the touch data from the frame that's uh, both movement and shape stable and has been around and has the longest lifespan. Um, so next I'm gonna talk about the pose matching process. Um, so the idea here is that, <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, thanks for that. Okay, um, all right. Um, yeah, so the idea here is that uh, we want to be able to compare touches that occurred at runtime to previously observed touches that we would collect through, for example, like through a training phase. Um, so to compare the, the, cut, the touch that occurred at runtime to previously observed touches, we have to um, normalize them so that they can be comparable. So we do a three-step, uh, a simple like two-step normalization process. We just fit a bounding box and translate um, the top left corner of the bounding box to the origin. And then to actually do the, um, the matching process, we extended the functionality of the P dollar recognizer. So the P dollar, the P dollar recognizer is a point cloud uh, recognizer that matches points that are points. But since we have ellipses, P dollar can handle the additional, um, the additional properties of ellipses. So the additional properties being um, area, being um, orientation, so forth. 
Um, so there's more um, detail in the paper about the proposal matching process, but essentially what we do is we line up all the templates and we go through and step through and we compare each one until we find which template is the best match. So that's the template with like the lowest distance score. This template is most closely resembles the pose that we just extracted from the touch data. And so now I've explained to you that we've like extracted this touch data, we've lined up some ellipses, but how do we actually predict these using the intended touch point? Um, so we take the best match template, and since these were created during a training phase, we know where the user's intended target was when this template was created. Um, so we can apply, we know the offset from the weighted centroid of the best match template. And what we do is we take that offset, we apply it to the weighted centroid of the touch of the, the pose that was created at runtime, and that gives us our predicted touch location. Okay, so just to recap, so smart touch is a three-step process. So first we have to um, extract the most relevant touch data, and then we go through a pose matching process, and then finally using data collected from the best match template from the pose matching process, we actually do our um, touch point prediction. Uh, so finally, I'm going to talk about the evaluation of smart touch. So we, we performed an evaluation of smart touch using the touch data collected from our 10 participants that were inside of our exploratory study of touch behavior. Uh, so first thing we have to um, ask ourselves is that which number of templates is smart touch most effective? So we did uh, an analysis of that, and we discovered that at 30 templates, we were able to achieve the best performance. So that's what we used. And for our main analysis, we asked ourselves, how accurate is smart touch compared to land or in a liftoff? So for, in terms of accuracy, we look at the offset distance between the land or in a liftoff points to the crosshairs and the distance between the predicted smart touch point to the center of the crosshairs. Uh, so in our evaluation here, you can see, so uh, things kind of got a little messed up here. Um, so we found that smart touch was uh, significantly more accurate than um, both land on a liftoff. And you can see here that um, for, yeah, those got messed up. So that's supposed to be over participants 1, 6, and 10. So you can see here that for those participants, smart touch was able to provide a huge um, increase in performance. And... Even with um, participants in which the, the distances between land on a liftoff were much closer, um, as for example, as you can see in participants four and seven here, um, smart touch was still able to provide some benefit. Um, so just one part for discussion here. Um, it's important to note that even with smart touch, um, these error offsets are still in centimeters, so we're not to the accuracy um, points that we want to get to quite yet, uh, but we're getting there, and that's what our continued research is going to work on. We hope to eliminate any performance differences when it comes to touch accuracy um, between people with motor impairments and between non-disabled users. Um, so, so for our future work, we also want to improve to look at improving accessibility of mobile touch-enabled devices. Um, so there's going to be some differences between the touch behaviors compared to a tabletop, compared to a mobile device like a smartphone or tablet. So we want to be able to um, find those differences and design to eliminate them. And then we're also interested in improving touch interaction for users with situational impairments. So if you're on your smartphone and you're walking, we know that you're less accurate. So we also want to see if we can provide benefits for people in those situations as well. Uh, so in our conclusion, I provided a, I um, talked about a study of the exploratory, like an exploratory study of touch behavior of 10 people with uh, motor impairments, and I also um, described uh, the creation and evaluation of smart touch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I think we don't have time for questions, but all the quarter will be available in the coffee break or. Thank you.